Hello and welcome to the Airline Solutions Monthly Webinar. My name is Mladen Milicic and I'm the Solutions Director here at Airline Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we are organizing across topics of interest in the world of Erlang and dealing with solutions based on the Erlang programming language. Our topic today will be dealing with learning Erlang and the fact that achieving this might be easier than you think. Over the years, experience has shown Erlang is a language that is easy to learn, pick up and start using. This fact has indeed been one of the major causes of the explosive expansion of Erlang across industries and sectors where it can make a significant contribution, for example, financial services, betting and gambling, online telecommunications, energy and many other sectors. In terms of learning Erlang, perhaps the biggest challenge in that process lies in changing the way we think. Now, as with any live event, please excuse any technical issues we may encounter today. To start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a products and services oriented company completely devoted to the Erlang programming language. Since our founding in 1999, we have worked with organizations and individuals using Erlang, helping evolve the language and supporting people and businesses using it. Today, we have about 80 people across our offices in London, Stockholm, Krakow and Budapest and working on projects across the globe. We are very keen on creating value and competitive advantage for our customers across industries and through the unique features and characteristics of Erlang as a language. We are ambitious in development of Erlang-based products and we work to create lasting partnerships with our customers. Now I'm pleased to say that um, today we have two speakers joining us and whom we have carefully selected as best invited to tell you about Erlang and the optimal ways of learning the language. First of all, Francesco Cesarini, the Erlang Solutions founder and technical officer, will start us off. Francesco has spent years working with Erlang and passing on knowledge of Erlang to others across sectors and dealing with continuously evolving use cases. I'm also very privileged to say that our second speaker who needs little introduction is Robert Verding, one of the co-authors of the Erlang language. Robert started Erlang itself all those years ago and today devotes himself to helping others learn Erlang and benefit from the language. Please allow me to finish by saying you are welcome to post questions throughout the duration of the webinar by using the chat facility. Our speakers, Francesco and Robert, will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. If any questions do go unanswered, you are welcome to raise them via email using the following address, webinar at erlang-solutions.com. That's webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you're interested in learning more about Erlang or wish to establish whether the language might be a solution for the challenges your own business may be facing, please feel free to contact me directly. My email address will be displayed in one of the final slides of the presentation we will share with you today. The same goes for any other questions you may have. Feel free to contact us. I would now like to hand over to Francesco Cesarini, who will be glad to start us off. Hi there. I think we should just start, Robert and I should start introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm Francesco Cesarini, the founder and technical director here at Erlang Solutions. Um, started my career yeah, at the computer science lab with Robert and other airline co-inventors uh, back in 1995. And you know, it was you know, at Ericsson, um, at Ericsson Training Consulting Arm when I taught my first airline course in a research triangle park. It was in 1997. I still remember it clearly and well, loved it. And you know, I've never looked back. I've you know, been giving training courses ever since. And on top of giving your know, training courses you know, for corporates, I've also been teaching at universities. Um, I've ta I taught for 10 years at the IP University of Gothenburg. I've had over 700 students, and many of them who ended up working for Erlang Solutions. And well, I'm glad to say Rob has taken over there. And more recently, I'm teaching at the Industrial Master's uh, Program at Oxford University here in the UK. Robert? Um, hi, yeah, I'm Robert Burling. So. Yes, I'm one of the original people from the um, computer science lab, and we started working with Erlang well, sometime around the late 80s. It's a bit, bit hazy. Um, and I was one of the original team that were working there. I worked continually with Erlang and other things as well for the um, computer science lab through the 90s. Um, a group of us left to form Bluetail, which was one of the first companies. To, to use Erlang in products, we're from the first companies outside Ericsson to do that. Um, I've worked a bit for Swedish military procurement, and for the last three years, I've been well working for Erlang Solutions. Now mainly with training. 
And I can say one thing, I started giving courses in Erlang even before Francesco. So sometime around 91, we in the lab started giving courses in Erlang for Ericsson. Now, when was your first university yeah. course you taught? 92 or 93, I can't remember. Uh, that was the one Ulf Wieger was on. That, uh, that, was the one, that was the one, yes, we gave some courses together with Bjorn Dechter, who was our boss then at um, KTH. Yeah, yeah, that was 1992, okay. yes, that's right. 92, yeah. yeah. We'd been giving Allen courses internally before that as well too, yeah. which were quite fun because you could actually ring telephones in the, in the, during the course. <laughs> so. Yes, Nali gave a quick introduction about Erlang solutions, but I think our focus is you know, very much on scalable full tolerance systems, and you know, we're working from embedded to cloud, and you know, supercomputers, um, and we're the only company of its kind completely focused on Erlang and the Erlang community. So, you know, on top of giving courses, you know, we've got events worldwide, but you know, one of the real catalysts in the company is all of the R and D, which which we do. So, you know, we're going to start off by speaking a little bit about, you know, the problem um, you know, Robert and his team were facing at the computer science lab and, you know, what problem they were trying to solve and, you know, what the solution to that problem was. Yeah, because that very much affects why Alan looks like it does. Um, it's a very pragmatic problem, very pragmatic language. So the basic problem we had from Ericsson is that they had, a, a, well, they still have a telephone switch called AXC, which was a very good product. Ericsson sold a lot of it, made a ton of money on it, on it, and was a very successful product. But it was quite costly and difficult to maintain. Um, so one of the things we got at, from the lab was, how can we um, simplify de developing and maintaining these types of applications? Um, that was the type of thing we were trying to attack in the, in the lab. Okay, they weren't quite as bad as that, but never mind. Yes, they were quite complex. It was quite a big application to do, and how could, how could we simplify that and work with that? And, um, okay, what, what type of applications are these? Okay, what, what is a telecoms application? And they have a number of, um, what's the problem domain we're working on? They have a number of properties. Um, these type of applications. So, for example, they are, they have to be massively concurrent. If we're talking about a telecom switch here, we might have hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers, may have tens of thousands of calls going on at the same time. All these things must run independently. Um, they have to be fault tolerant. They, they, they're, not, they're just not allowed to fail, to go down, and things like this. You need, so you need redundancy in the system. For example, you cannot allow things to fail. Um, you need distribution. You cannot build a fault tolerant system with on one computer. That computer can go down and the system will go down. So you need at least two computers. Um, some people say you need at least three to make it properly, but you need at least two computers. You need redundancy in the system. Um, so you need support for distribution in the system at, at, at all times. Um, you need fault tolerance. You have to accept the fact that in a complex system like this, things are going to go wrong. That's just, um, there's just no way around it. You always get things go wrong. There might be software errors, there might be hardware errors, or things like this. The classic telecoms case is that someone digs up the telephone lines and you get a dirge of um, spurious messages coming in and they might crash the system. And the system just must, just must not be able to go down. You have to be able to detect errors, you have to be able to isolate errors, and you have to be able to uh, clean up after errors occur. These, these are the typical type of things going out for it. Um, well, there are some more specific type of telecoms type things, you have to be talking to hardware and stuff like this, but otherwise, you have the concept of time in the system. Um, you need to be able to upgrade the system, do all forms of upgrade in the system, while the system is running. You cannot, uh, you cannot take the system down, say, to do code upgrades. So you need support for doing code upgrades in the system. And there are many of these features. Now, the, what, what I find the interesting thing is that um, these things are not um, airline specific, or not telecom specific, rather. 
they um, they are typical of many different types of um, applications you will find today. And I think many applications, they have these basic requirements, although sometimes they're just not explicitly stated. It's assumed that this is just known. For example, if you have a lot of systems, they will ask, they will say, you ask them, yes, do you want to be able to do things, a lot of things concurrently, and of course they'll, they'll say, of course they do. And of course they won't do that, but that, although they might have explicitly specified. So there are many of these features. So these, these the problem domain is very broad and very interesting. So, Francesco, you were... Yeah, I mean, the problem domain was interesting, but also I think I'd like to just add to what you've said. Um, at the same time, there was a lot happening in... Uh, um, you know, uh, there was a lot happening. You had the whole deregulation of the telecom market, um, and at the same time you're going from kind of vertical network, single-service network, to multi-service network. So, you know, when you were working, you know, voice was voice, a video, you know, cable TV just ran on cable TV networks and internet, it just ran on internet. Um, you know, and what we were also seeing was the whole migration from, you know, these vertical networks to, uh, you know, uh, services which would share the same backbone. And, you know, thinking of it, you know, what, what you've described is not just telecom, you know, but the, the, the requirements are the same. You pick up a phone, you expect to hear a two-two on the other end. You chat on Facebook today. Uh, you expect the chat just to work out of the box. You know, uh, you click buy on on Amazon. You know, the last thing you want is a five hundred error. Yeah, happening. And so, you know, the problem domain is not just specific to telecoms. It's it's you know, it's it's used in you know these types of systems we're developing today, which have become you know which have become, you know, the, the web scale of, uh, you know, of, of this uh, decennium. Now, Erlang itself, you know, verticals where Erlang can be used, you know, it's not just telecom. Um, you'll find Erlang running in cars. You'll find it rubbing, run, running in robots. Uh, just the other day, there was a YouTube video of a drone being powered by Erlang where when the drone was flying, they actually did a software upgrade. Um, Airlines powering the, the back end of some of the largest massively multi user online gaming. Um, a lot of the free to, to play uh, mobile games, mobile back ends, uh, a lot of you know, betting and gambling sites are using it as the review and logic. It's made its entrance into healthcare. You know, NHS Fine in the UK is you know, based on React um, and Airlines uh, an OSPL database, as is storage of all medical records in Denmark. Uh, you're seeing more and more companies using it for online ads. Actually, it's easier to find companies not using it like for online ads. Um, you, you, you know, from your know, real-time bidding, you know, serving the ads, um, new media, um, online newspapers. You know, a great example is the Huffington Post. Um, so you know, the Boston Globe's backend is all based on airline. Um, online payments, you know, Klarna, you know, will handle is handling billions of euros in payments um, every year, and you know they're, they're approximating about thirty percent of all online payments in Scandinavia go through an airline based system. You know, we could continue instant messaging, logistics, etc., etc., etc. So you know, there are lots and lots of areas where all of the features of telecom Robert has described um, fit in. Okay, so where did we come from this study looking at the problem domain um, and trying to work out how, how we're going to solve the problem we had, or Ericsson had? Um, one of the things to realize is that the airline development has always been extremely pragmatic. Uh, our goal was to solve the problem. Um, our goal was not to choose a certain way of doing it. How are we going, just going to look at how we're going to do it. And what we arrived at, the basic principles, that a language or a system would need to solve this type of problem, you need lightweight concurrency. It has to be massive concurrently, it has to be asynchronous communication, it has to be massively scalable as well, which means you can't have shared data on the system. It just does not scale properly. You need immutability in the system uh, just to keep track of what's going on. Also, you need fault isolation. You need to be able to, to, to localize and contain faults. And also you need the primitives for doing well, self-healing to make the system get, keep, keep going and, and to keep handle when things go wrong, because they always go wrong. 
uh, we need support for continuous ev ev evolution of the system, in this case, dynamic code upgrades. Um, there are other things as well, too. So we had some other principles. We wanted a simple, high-level language to do this. Uh, simple for many reasons. One, it's easier to, to implement. It's easier to learn if, it's, if the language is simple. The problem with a simple language is getting right. You, you, you want it simple in the sense that you have a, a very few, a small number of basic principles that you can build, use building your system. And if you get these right, you'll get a language which, can, which is very powerful, but it's still small, it's easy to co comprehend and to use. So in this sense, small is very good. We also found, which is in conjunction with this, that you, you should provide tools for building the system, not ready-made solutions. We found this out the hard way. Often when we try to make solutions for various problems, we usually got them wrong. We misinterpret the problem and things like this. And often they become too, too, too limited. So a tool becomes either very specific and very limited to use, or it gets very verbose and to try and contain everything, do everything in the system, and becomes practical and useful. So we wanted to keep things as simple in all ways. So, I mean, it was a simple, I mean, the result was a simple language. I mean, if you think of it, at the end of, uh, of the three-day course, uh, the very first three-day courses we were giving at Ericsson, uh, the developers who, you know, on day one came in without knowing any airline, left having programmed a soft switch. They actually had phones, you know, hardware. They were provided the hardware, they had phones, which allowed them to um, you know, call each other. I mean, it was uh, a great reaction, a great satisfaction which came out of it. And yeah, literally at the end of the three-day course, you know most of the language and the philosophy behind it. Um, it was built you know, to be compact and to be taught in, in a very, very short time frame. And you know, for most constructs, there's only one way you, know, you can solve a problem. It's uh, dynamically typed. Uh, that allows you, you know, lots of flexibility when you're doing software upgrade during runtime, so you, know, you can you know, make sure your systems never go down. There are no user-defined data types, um, so you know, once again, adds to the simplicity. Uh, you've got a lot of you know, built-in primitives for both concurrency and error handling, and I think you know, that's really where you know, some of the strengths come in in airline with uh, no shared, with no shared memory approach and the message passing approach and also you know very you know one of the few languages well only language i'm aware of which has built in primitives for distribution so um, you know by doing it right you you've got a program running on a single machine you can easily distribute it across a cluster of machines with no or very very little effort and you know what we usually say is you, know, you can emulate the logic of airline by building languages and copying it, but at the same time, if it's not running on the Airline Virtual Machine, it is very, very hard to emulate the semantics. And you know, the question we always ask us is why use external libraries you've got no control over when you can instead use constructs which are built in the language itself. So, so um, if you're teaching people Airline or people are learning Airline, where do they struggle? What are the major problems people have when learning Airline? And I'd say there are two main groups. So sim basic airline, the simple sequential language, it's a, it's a simple functional language. There's nothing really strange about it as such. And the problems people have with learning that part of the language is what you typically get when you're looking at functional languages if, you, if you're new to them. There are concepts of things like you have immutable data in the system. You have immutable variables. Um, you generally don't have uh, looping constructs, but you have to use recursion. Um, there's pattern matching, which is a very powerful tool, but it's a completely different way of thinking of things. And these are the typical stand standard things you'll get from learning any functional language. The second group, or the second group of um, problems people have, is thinking concurrently. Seeing seeing concurrency built into the language, that that is our way of structuring the system. We don't think in objects and think in classes. We, we think in processes, the concurrency of the system, how they work, how they interact with each other. So we don't have classes. We don't have objects with state. We can't have because we have immutable data. Um, but we use concurrency, processes, message passing. Uh, we don't have any shared memory. 
And these are things which are new to, to many people. But as Francesco mentioned, as I can say from personal experience, after three days, people, most people actually get it right. They can, they can do it and they can write real code in the system. And so yeah. I mean, just to add uh, here, I mean, why, why do people struggle? I mean, recursion is not something you know, typical to Erlang. Recursion is one of the foundations of computer science. And, you know, everyone should understand recursion. Um, mm. Immutable, you know, data and variables. You know, I've got an example here in the next slide. Um, it's actually the way we got taught to deal with maths when we were, you know, studying algebra in school. You know, when we were in school, they didn't teach you to write A is equal to A plus 1. That doesn't make sense. Um, and in fact, you know, Erlang has taken a different approach. They've taken the approach um, of how we used to be taught in school. And it's, uh, you know, B is equal to A plus 1, where, you know, once A is bound, you cannot change its value. And, you know, so almost instead of calling it variable, we actually call them singletons. And, uh, you know, doing it this way, um, you know, by having single assignment of variables, the programmers are forced to write short, concise functions, and you know, by default, you'll get a smaller number of errors in your code, and it enforces a style which makes the code easier to understand and maintain. And, and it's just a question of you know of unlearning you know some of the bad habits uh, people have got gotten in other using other languages and going back to more natural, normal way of thinking and reasoning. Yeah, um, and. Well, if you look, if you look, at, look at well, not just Erlang, but other many other languages and many other systems, you'll find the data structures that are inherently uh, recursive. So, for example, you have the list data structure. So it consists of well, it consists of a list, consists of something which is an element, and more things which are another list, or it might consist of the empty list, which is the thing at the bottom here. So the the definition of a list itself is recursive. So therefore, it's quite natural that any functions working on lists are also recursive because they reflect um, the data structure they're working on. The same thing if you're working with trees, tree structures. They are also recursive in that the subnodes of the tree will also be trees. So having a data, having a functions, recursive functions to work on trees fits very nicely into the actual um, data structure you're looking at. Um, and yeah, so, so we have, have a very simple code example here. Um, this is actually from one of the exercises in the course. So we're writing a very small, small little database um, as, as a list of tuples, of key value tuples. So the, the function store here takes a key and a new value and puts it into, into the list. Um, Seeing all data is immutable, we can't make a new list, we can't modify data, I mean we have to recurse and make new lists. In this case we're also using pattern matching. So the first, first bit of the function here, the first clause is called an ally, that just checks is the key, the one, the one key we want to put a new value in, is that the first element of the list. If it is, we replace it with a key and a new value and just return that and the rest of the list. If it's not the first element, then we end up in the second clause, the second part of the function here, we, and we just say, well, we call ourselves recursively to see if it's in the rest of the list, and we build a new list with the element we're not interested in, and what we get back more importantly. And in the third clause, the last case here, we, we, when we hit the end of the list, that means we haven't found it, so we add it. So it's a new list, we just return it. And you can see when stepping down, the example when stepping down here, I'm working at FME and I want to now become ESL, so we want to add uh, Robert, the key me, and then uh, ESL in the system. And as the first call, we find that um, I am not Joe, so I'm going to return Joe at ERA, which is a part of Ericsson, and we call, myself, call ourselves recursively to see if I'm in the rest of the list. And then we find, yes, I am, I'm in the first element of the list, so I'll, I'll replace that element with one which is Robert ESL, and we just return the rest, rest of the list, which is Mike at ERA, and build a new list. So we have um, stepped down the list recursively, because that fits the list, and we've replaced an element and built a new list coming back up again. This is just the, tip, the typical pattern here. And here we see we're actually, well, not just using recursion, but we're actually using pattern matching as well. 
we're using pattern matching to select the clause, which clause we want to do. Um, pattern matching is a very powerful tool in that it allows us not it allows us to write down what we want the data structure to look like and not worry about how we're going to do testing is going to look like so and we use this both when we're building structures and we are uh, and when we're matching trying to test against them. So we don't say we don't write down how we're going to test what a structure looks like. We just write down in this case what we want the structure to look like and let the system um, do that for us. That's a very powerful tool that makes for often makes for very concise code. Again, this is not something outline specific, but most functional languages have it because it is a very nice tool. But we have Outline has actually extended pattern matching, not just to use normal data structures. We can um, do, for example, do pattern matching on binaries, on binary data. So the first um, part here, the first four lines, is actually a Allen data type called a binary, which is just a sequence of bytes and bits. And this pattern describes um, an IP packet, structure of an IP packet in one go. So it's a four bit version, it's a four bit header length, it's an eight bit service type, it's a 16 bit total length, 16 bit ID, etc., etc., etc. There's the source IP, which is 32 bits, and the destination IP, which is 32 bits, etc., the datagram, which is the rest of the binary. And this structure can both be used to pull apart an IP packet into its parts. We can also use in reverse, we can use this structure to build an IP packet in one go. So we're not interested here in saying how we pull something apart. We're interested in building it. We're interested in saying what does it look like and let the system do it. The examples down below are just three examples from a problem I've been looking at a bit. It's just, this is just an interface to talk to a, um, a local exchange inside, inside a, in a hotel where you can send information, find information. And these just map extremely well onto, onto binaries. And again, I can use pattern matching to build, to test if it's what it is, which message it is, or to build a message. So they're, they're very, it's a very powerful tool. Um, it's often, it's new to many people. It's not something that many people are used to, but after a while, most, most people, as I say, just get it and do it. I think the key is getting it. Like, yeah, the, the key to actually getting it is practice and you know and exercises oh, yeah. and uh, yeah. oh yeah 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 you can't you, you yes it's, it's one thing seeing it, another thing actually using it. And we do have a lot of exercises in our courses to do that. So. I mean, it's typical. You sit there, you you explain it. Everyone nods. Everyone understands it. But the first time you know, someone has to write their own recursive function, you know, it takes yes. it it takes a slight adjustment to seeing okay which of these recursive patterns should I use and how do I break up my problem into recursive yeah. in, into into this particular pattern. But once you've done it, it just starts coming naturally. Yeah, yeah, pe yes, uh, yes. People typically try to write it as a sequence of if nested if then else's, but um, after a while, when you see it, the pattern matching is so much simpler to do. Yeah, and. So uh, another thing, you know, people tend to struggle with is is concurrency, and once again, you know, the reason to struggle, you know, understanding concurrency is not because it's hard, but it's just because they're trained to think in in a different way, um, you know, possibly an imperative approach, a pullback approach, or maybe even an object-oriented approach. But you know, if you stop and think, or just look at this picture, uh, uh, you know, to quote Joe Armstrong, um, the world is concurrent. And you know, we're talking about the world around us here. Things in the world don't share data, and you know things communicate with messages, and things fail. So you know how do you model a language uh, around these tenets, around these rules? And that's you know that's what it feels that they've done with Erlang. Uh, just you know try to picture a um, a system handling uh, TV voting for SMS. There are quite a few of those written in Erlang around. Every SMS coming in, every TV vote coming in, is handled in its own process and in its own standalone process. And the process will live for as long as you know, that SMS is being handled when the votes, you know, when the SMS is being parsed and the vote is being counted and we've sent back an acknowledgement uh, to the user, that process terminates. You know, the same could apply to instant messaging. You know, every message you send, every message you receive, every status update, you know, every login and logout request, 
are also standalone processes. And these processes live for as long as you're handling that particular request. You know, that means that you know, some buggy code will uh, you know, cause the process to crash. You're, the only thing which will be affected is that particular message which, which you're dealing and handling, and not all of the other messages which will be handled in parallel. So you know, that, that, that's usually the way you have to think and reason, which is you know, a very, very natural way. I mean, if you just think of us as human beings, we're all interact, you know, we all interact with each other through message passing. I go in, I, I mention, I say something, and you, you'll receive that message. Uh, you and I don't share memory, and you know, occasionally we get hit by a bus. But you know, even if we get hit by a bus, um, everyone else around us keeps on running, at least here in the kitchen. So it's, uh, it's a very natural way of thinking, and they've just applied it um, you know, to, to the actor model, to, to concurrency in Ireland. And you know, getting used to thinking that way is fairly straightforward. Once again, all it needs is, um, is practice. So, you know, so yeah, I, I just want to make one, one comment to, 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 to Francesco. It is also a very nice way of, well, he, Fra Francesco mentioned error handling because because then you can let processes die when something goes wrong and know that they will not affect other things going on. In our case, it originally was telephony, so if something goes wrong with a call and the processes managing that call would crash, but everything else will just keep on working and we could do error recovery. Um, it's much easier to do things like logging because you, you're localized and you've localized information and state to one process and don't have to worry about everything else at the same time. So, so it's a very nice model, but in many ways, sometimes it's just different from how people are used to thinking. Again, I, mean, I think most people understand it after a while. I mean, what you're doing is you know, you're avoiding all the incidental difficulties, the difficulties which are there because you picked the wrong, you know, the wrong tool for the job. And instead, you know, it allows you to focus on the things we, which actually are hard. And yeah. if you look at the case of SMS or you know, instant messaging, what is hard is not dealing with the messages in parallel all coming in. What's really hard there is um, the, the distribution of the state, the distribution of the data, you know, possibly across data centers, you know, to provide protocol tolerance. And so avoiding you know, this, you know, getting rid of all the incidental difficulties, you just focus on you know, the real tough parts of the problem, which you know, are hard in any language you pick. So, you know, where, where, where do you learn airline? Well, first of all, if you're lucky enough to attend a university which teaches it, um, you know, then, you know, go for it. Um, there are, you know, universities all along, I'd say the first university to pick it up was KTH in 1992. Uppsala University uh, picked it up in 1994. I was actually in the class when the first Fort Carcani over there. You know, the IT University had been doing it for over a decade. Um, Oxford here in the UK picked it up in 2011. You know, other UK universities include uh, Harriet Watt and the University of Kent. And um, you know, Middlesex University here in London are kind of just going to start teaching it next fall as well. Um, if you look at the US, um, you know, Caltech's been teaching it for a while. Uh, Kansas University is going to include it and teach it alongside Haskell. Uh, it's been taught in well, Israel, Ben Gurion University is. Uh, I'd say in the Philippines, in Spain, France, everywhere. You know, it, it, it's everywhere. But I'd like to specify: they're actually not teaching Erlang as a language. What they're actually doing is using Erlang, you know, to te as a tool to teach certain aspects of um, computer science. And these aspects of computer science could include, you know, concurrency, could include parallelism, uh, distribution, and more recently, even multiple programs. So what they do is they'll teach the theory, and then the students get to use Erlang uh, for their exercises to apply that theory they're being taught. Yeah, if you're not, well, there are always books. There are quite a few Erlang books now. The number's been slowly growing. The one in the middle, the light, white, bluish, green one, that's the original book. Uh, we wrote one in 93, an Erlang book concurrent programming in our language, which is to describe the language, and also, which is still interesting, I think, we're actually giving examples where you would actually interface and control hardware from that book. Um, it was quite funny because we were allowed to print the book, but the system itself was still proprietary Ericsson. But um, yeah, 
It was I bought one of those in 1994. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were selling. Well, did you get the blue one? Or... Just proprietary variants. Yeah. Did you get the blue one or the red one? The blue one. The red one's the second edition, which contains. I, I was in the lab when you had the deadline for the red one and uh, received the first copies, only to realize they completely forgotten uh, to do the chapter in distribution, which was yeah. the between the first one and the second one. So uh, I remember that. Yes, that was. Did it have a chapter on object orientation in Ireland by any chance? <laughs> There's a chapter on it, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, I'm not. I'm not a true believer of object orientation <laughs> in Ireland or anything else for that matter. <laughs> but there are quite a few books. There, there are more coming. Um, you know, all the time. And I think there are tons of yeah, tons of books. I mean, they've been uh, you know translated to you know, Korean, Russian, Chinese, Japanese. Their books in Spanish have been translated to French, um, yeah, and there are also you know a lot of specialist books. I mean, when it became you know at you know back in two thousand and six, you know, Joe Armstrong came out with his new book, you know, programming mm -hmm. Alan. It was the first Alan book in over a decade, and probably about a year or two later, it became public that um, Simon Thompson and I were writing a book for O'Reilly. You know, and someone went in and questioned, if we already have a great book, why do we need a second book? Uh, and that's when I actually went out and said, we don't need two books, we actually need a bookshelf full of books, because you know, different people take different approaches when writing and, and teaching Caroline. And, uh, and that's what, uh, you know, if you want, want Joe's book, uh, Joe would cover very much in detail, and it's a reflection of his character, lots of enthusiasm, and he will go in and tell you why you should be using Caroline. If you want a, uh, an in-depth uh, view of airline, well, then it's the Riley book that you probably want. If you know, learning from airline from great good, it's a great book, it's available online free of charge, and um, also, you know, it covers um, airline and the parts of OTP. And you know, just you have next year are you know, books on testing with airline, and Paul for the book on the standing scalability with airline OTP. You know, there's a book on the airline VM internals, and you know, and these are just some of the books. Uh, I'm aware of, which still have to come out, mm -hmm. probably even more. But you know, for those of you interested, you know, using the discount code of D on the O'Reilly website, you'll get 40% of printed books and 50% of the digital ones, mm -hmm. uh, which are listed above all 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 of the above books, all um, you know, provided by O'Reilly. We also, you know, another place where you can earn airline is the user groups all over the world. Um, and what they've started running is something called Etude for Airline. Uh, they currently have, uh, they're currently being run in New York, in Seattle, and they'll soon start in San Francisco. And you know, if you do run, run an airline user group close by, we really warmly recommend it. Etude for Airline is you know, based on a set of exercises which were published by O'Reilly. They're freely available online, or you could buy the PDF if you want. And what you do is people prepare their exercises, and then they come in. And you know, spend two hours together with experts and review all, all of the exercises. You know, get feedback, and uh, and you know, in some cases, uh, do a bit of pair programming, you know, uh, and you know, help each other coming up to speed with that. Right? And you know, they've run it very, very successfully in New York, and they're actually in their second round right now. And I actually, believe you know, for those of you who are in New York, uh, they're meeting this evening uh, down at the Landers on Barrick Street. And another way to learn Erlang is using e-learning. Um, you know, e-learning. You know, uh, it was a project which you know, Erlang Solutions worked with together with the University of Kent, and you know, it, it you know through a grant from the Department of Trade and Industry Knowledge Transfer Partnership, and it contains about eight hours of video. It contains um, interactive exercises. You can upload your exercises, and you get tests. Uh, tests are run on them, semantic analysis are done, so you get automated feedback. Um, it's integrated with Safari from O'Reilly, the you know, forums, and you know if you're interested in that, using Webinar 50, you'll get a 50% discount, and this discount code is valid until uh, the 31st of December of this year. And obviously, you know, you can also go in and get, you know, and, and um, you can also go in and um, attend one of the training courses, one of the many training courses we provide.
Robert, do you want to talk a bit more about them? Yeah, um, well, yes. The, the, the five-day courses, so the Alling by example course, that, that's, that's a, it's a five-day course about Alling, about the Alling language and using the Alling language and what's part of it. Um, we can just mention all the courses, these courses are very, there, there are a lot of exercises and practical work in them. So, so they're a combination of presentations of um, lectures, you might say, and there are, there is um, exercises and time to exercise in between to, to practice on it, which, which, which you find you always do need. So the Alang by example is basically all of the Alang language in five-day course. Usually it's the time for a bit of other stuff as well. Um, OTP, that's about what's called the OTP, the Open Telecom Platform. That is a set of library. the OTP is a set of libraries and sets of design patterns and support for these design patterns for building robust fault tolerance systems in Alang. So Alang provides the basic tools for it. OTP is a, is a big set of libraries for doing this. Um, it's called the Open Telecom Platform, but there's absolutely nothing about telecoms in it as such. There's nothing telecom specific about it as such. I think the most telecom specific has got an ASN.1 parser, and AS is one is used in the telecom specifications for interfaces. That's about the closest we get to the pure telecom support. But it's a way of building um, support and a, and, a, and a pattern for building fault tolerance systems. I would say most serious Alang applications today use OTP, maybe not exclusively, maybe most parts of it. Uh, Alang for test, well that's that's this course for doing for, for doing testing in Alang. So um, other companies, amongst other Ericsson, they use Alang as their test environment. So for testing for testing their hardware written in other other languages, they, they're using Alang. Testing environments built in Alang. And this is a course which which helps you do that. We have a number of three-day courses, which are sort of trimmed down versions of the five-day courses. So there's Alang Express and OTP Express, where we've taken out, the, where we go through the most important parts of it. Um, Alang for, de for DevOps, that's a course for, for operators of the system. And um, it's not so much for Alang programmers as such, but for people managing Alang systems. So we start looking about, well, how, how to install and build uh, Alang runtime environments, how you start the system, how you monitor the system, what's going on, what's happening inside the system, how much memory is using, CPU, message queues, um, how it works with the file system, how you can patch and release handling, how, 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 can you, how, how do I actually do code upgrade while the system is on the flight? Uh, looking at distributed systems, looking at the system itself to try and see what's going on inside it. How is the Alan system behaving? Is it behaving as I think it should? Uh, we have logging and tracing facilities. All, all these type of things that you want from, from the operator point of view um, when you're managing Alan systems. It's, uh, it's not directly for Alan programmers, although even Alan programmers would find this interesting to do. Um, we can also specially tailor courses for, for specific needs. Um, a common one is one I've given a number of times is we'll take the OT three-day OTP Express and the five-day OTP Express course and put them together saying five-day course. And we run together through both of them. It's a bit packed, but um, it's perfectly feasible to do, and it gives you a very good feel for doing both the Alan and the OTP side, so building more practical systems. So um, we also have, have a course. Lot of course. Yeah, we, all, we also have a course on um, XMPP and airline, so yeah. the Mongoose IM, which you know, we give on demand as well. I'm mm -hmm. sure you know, for those of you who were in on the yeah, they're, they're more, uh, instant more messaging webinar earlier. around products. Um, we we don't give them ourselves, but we we also provide courses in, like in React, for example, which is built on top of as well. Yeah. yeah. So yes, we we do have a lot of courses. We are uh, starting with a very aggressive um, uh, you know, scheduled courses um, right now. You know, next year we're planning on having scheduled courses, so for for individuals in uh, Stockholm, London, Krakow, and Budapest. Uh, in Krakow and Budapest, will be in Polish, respective in in Hungarian. Um, we're aiming for Berlin, New York, and Chicago in conjunction with the Airline Factory Lights. We'll be giving there. Uh, San Francisco as well. In San Francisco, um, there's scheduled courses now in uh, the end of November, if I remember correctly. 
and also in conjunction with the Airline Factory Light, you'll be with the Airline Factory um, conference uh, next March. So between the third to the fifth of March, we'll be doing all of the training, and it will be airline courses, OTP courses. Um, we'll also be providing courses on um, using airline Neo and SIP. Uh, and the 6th and the 7th of March, we have the conference itself. You know, we expect you know, there will be eight tracks. There will be probably in excess of 50 speakers. Um, you know, everyone who's anyone in the airline community will be there. We'll be talking about you know, basic and advanced subjects. There will be case studies. Um, certainly an event not to be missed. And yeah, why learn airline? Well, there are a lot of companies out there recruiting, a lot of companies looking for airline developers, and you know, doing a lot of really, really interesting products. So um, it's there don't, don't seem to be enough airline programmers to go around these days, mm -hmm. and I think you know, that's one of the things which is um, you know, slowing you know, kind of the language adoption, and you know, one of the things we're working on uh, here at Airline Solutions to resolve. Yeah, I can just say that those companies there. They're, they're the ones we know about. We also know there are a lot of other companies using Airline who just don't say anything. So find out through roundabout ways if this company is just using Airline inside the system. Uh, I mean, these are just some of the companies we know these about. Are just some it's of them. some of them, yeah. 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 Can, can I? Oh, okay, go. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to mention that the WhatsApp one's fun. It's interesting because it, it's a very good example of the, the concurrency that's possible inside Airline. Um, they came out of about a year and a half ago with a blog saying that they were running on one airline system on one on one computer. They were running two million concurrent TCP connections, uh, all being managed by airline. Now that was most likely being done by at least one airline process per TCP connection, which is the standard way of doing it. So, just to show that um, large scale concurrency, massive concurrency, is possible in airline, even in products, not just as sort of an academic exercise as well. WhatsApp have um, an active user base which is larger than Twitter, so uh, I think they need this <laughs> massive scalability. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of the other ones as well too. I mean, yeah. um, did, was um, um, did you have Dean were there? Yeah, they're all they're all there. Uh, they're all there. Yes, they they, they there, do yeah. the front end. They do the front ends for um, amongst other things the Call of Duty servers. Yeah, and they had last call I heard about the year ago about 16 million users, so so it's big and there is there's a lot of concurrency going on there and a lot of fault in systems. So yeah, now if we're going to take questions. I can keep on going as long as possible. <laughs> so can I. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Robert, and I'm sure that everyone who's attended the webinar will join me in thanking you for a very inspiring talk on Erlang. Now, throughout the webinar, we've been receiving questions, and whilst the number of questions received is uh, bigger than what we can answer in the available time, I've uh, picked a couple that I think would be interesting to start with. First of all, uh, a really interesting question coming from uh, Germany. Uh, Francesco and, and Robert, if you were sort of learning Erlang from scratch today, you know, how would you start? Would you start with books? Would you start with courses? Would you, you know, attend a conference? How would you begin from scratch in your attempt to learn Erlang today? I think it completely depends on what your objectives are. If uh, if you're a hobbyist and you want to learn it as a hobby project, uh, maybe you know start looking at uh, you know start you know looking at some of the books. Attend one of the events uh, and watch some of the videos online. You have to learn how airlines being used, so that you know, through the books you'll get the theoretical side. With um, and you know by attending conferences, you'll actually see how it how you know the theory is being uh, converted into practice. Um, E-learning is an excellent way of doing it um, as well. Uh, E-learning is usually used also by companies who have. Um, you know, geographical limitations or time limitations, so, you know, the, the delegates are able to learn airline in their own time in a location which is convenient for, uh, for them. You know, all they need to do is, uh, have a, have, you know, be online and have an internet connection. Um, you know, somewhere in between books and e-learnings are uh, airline by example. Um, uh, videocasts Simon Thompson and I did, uh, they're available on uh, O'Reilly.com. 
and there are about two hours of videos where we cover the basics of the language. So it's it's you know basically it's the basics. It's the simple parts of the language, but we will explain pattern matching. We will explain recursion. We will explain single assignment of variables, all with easy examples, which go hand in hand with the book. So it's just a way of listening to it differently. And then thirdly, you know, it's you know if you you're a company, you need to get up to speed quickly, or you know if if you're really interested in airline and you know, want to learn it as you know, as quickly as possible and avoid a lot of the beginner mistakes, so the most you know, kind of time-effective way properly is by attending one of the scheduled courses themselves. So you know, there is no answer uh, to this question now, and other than you know, it just completely depends on what your objectives are. Exactly. Well, yeah, it is. It is a bit of an open-ended question. I, I guess very dependent on 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 the person learning. Another quite practical question is: Are there any courses, airline courses of any type, planned in the coming months in Spain and North America specifically? So there is a course planned in San Francisco in um, in uh, the next two to three weeks. Um, and that's you can look, see that on our website from the airline hyphen solutions website we had a sold out course about a month ago in new york i think we had more people registered than what we could handle i think robert took care of that one and we're about to publish a schedule for north america in the next um, in the next couple of weeks but you know let us know where you're based and um, we'll do our best but we're aiming at you know scheduling courses in chicago New York and San Francisco next year. Um, the ones we know for sure will be happening um, the 3rd to the 5th of March in San Francisco. It's an airline course and alongside it an OTT course. Yeah, i just say one thing as well too, which I should have mentioned before when talking about courses. You can always book an airline course. If your company has a number of people and they want a, spe a specific course, you can book a course from us, not just the scheduled ones. Um, so th there's always that possibility. To, to do that as well. Thank you for that. We have an interesting question uh, from Germany. One of our uh, audience is basically interested in uh, knowing um, from the perspective of a C, C++ developer, what's the learning curve to sort of effectively translate to Erlang and become productive? So Ericsson had some really good um, did a study on this and I'm really frustrated they never went in and officially published those results. Uh, it's no trade secret, but what they found is that you know, someone coming straight out of university who you know, has worked with a lot of different languages while studying in university will be pro productive after about one month. So uh, that means you know, attending the airline course and the OTP course and then using airline and OTP. Uh, before and after. So um, about after one man month they'll, they'll be productive. Someone who's worked with a particular technology, and, you know, this could be C, C++. In Ericsson's case it was uh, Plex, which was you know, Ericsson's proprietary language. Um, they are usually productive within three months and that usually has to do with going in and you know, changing the way you think and reason. And um, once again, you know, this is after attending two courses. Obviously, you know, Productivity is measured in different ways. So, uh, you know, what these people would bring to the game is you know, a lot of other experiences as well, and not just programming, pure programming experience. But you know, to get off and running, you know, it's 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 easy. After three days, you know, anyone should be able to start coding. But mm -hmm. you, you really, you know, you reach, you become much more productive after you know, after having well, practiced for a few months. And and you know, that's the case, I guess, not only for Erlang, but you know, for any programming language. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you, Francesco. Um, one other question is, um, and quite on the pragmatic side, uh, what are the most used tools in detecting an airline application bottleneck, and uh, how about application tuning? Robert, you um, want to take this one? Well, uh, there, so the question again there is: are a of, yeah. yeah, there are a number of, number of tools being used. In the in the system for looking at the system, there are they, they come with the airline the airline release a number of profiling tools, um, which you can use to look at the system. There are a number of external tools which allow you to also to, to view the system, um, trying to, to try and see where bottlenecks occur in, in, in your things. 
So, so there are there are there are tools for doing that. Um, yeah, that's that's about the best I can say say at, at the moment. There are tools, there are tools and, me and methods of doing it. The outline, I could also say the outline system itself is very open in that it allows you to it allows you as the program or the, the application designer to make you make your own tools to look at the system while it's running. So all the, all these, for example, all the tools that made you can quite easily well could have written yourself in the sense that there's nothing special about them. The outline system allows you to look at the system itself. So Thank you, Robert. Worried. Now, okay. there's an interesting question, uh, sort of looking at you know the current state of Erlang. Uh, one of our audience is asking, where is Erlang at the moment in terms of uh, scaling out of the box on multi-core ar architecture? It does it straight by itself. Okay. How far has the language got in terms of you know how many cores it can scale to? I, I think that's what the question is alluding to. I yeah, think you can scale to about um, straight out of the box. You know, it, it's it's uh, eight to sixteen cores. In some cases, thirty-two or even sixty-four cores. What we've discovered right now is that the whole scalability is you know very much application dependent, mm -hmm. and um, it's the problem has to do with bottlenecks in the applications themselves. Uh, because if you've got one process which all of the other processes depend on, then that process becomes your bottleneck. So your system is as fast as your slowest point, in effect. And so there are tools which are being developed um, as part of the release project to actually find these bottlenecks and help so resolve them. But you know, I think I'd love to quote Castile here is that you know, when dealing with programming multiple, you need a new mindset. And I think Erlang is a good step in that direction, but I think lots of work still needs doing. And you know, that work is happening right now as I speak um, in, in terms of you know, a lot of the research projects which, uh, which are happening around it. So several millions in EU grants have been given uh, with Erlang. And uh, they're currently, you know, some of the best universities are actually working on this problem itself. So hopefully this time next year, you know, to answer your question, it will probably be you know, 32 to 64 cores. But most programs, yeah, most programs out of the box, 8 to 16 cores without any problems. Thank you, Francesco. There's another question uh, specifically asking, what is the recommended solution to interface legacy services and servers? Are there existing libraries, or should one always sort of build them from scratch? Um, there are a number of existing libraries already. Um, for example, there's an ODB C library for talking with databases. There are a number of online libraries for talking with various SQL databases. Um, so, so, so some exist. Um, there are a lot of open source libraries, um, you know, libraries interfacing major protocol stacks. So, uh, yeah, th th there's a lot. Th there's a lot out there, and and when there isn't, you do it. And I think you know the the, the um, bit syntax and the pattern matching Robert was showing is an ideal uh, solution to that problem. Fantastic. There's a, a bit of a philosophical question uh, in here as well. What do you both see as uh, the future of things to come for Erlang? Um, well, some things I know that uh, they're working on. The group are maintaining and developing Erlang, the OTP group in Ericsson. They're always working on improving scalability and use of uh, increasing, improving the use of multiple cores. So originally, when it came, when multi-core came out ten years ago. Or eight years ago, it was about two cores. Then it became four cores, eight. Now sixteen, even up to thirty or sixty cores. And they're they're always working on improving that, so that will come. Um, the language itself, it it develops slowly. Um, so there are new features coming. There'll be new features coming next year, which people have been waiting for. So it, it does develop slowly. Um, I think positive side of this, when things come out, they're very well tested, so you know they work. I think there's a very people. Are, there's so much Erlang legacy code out there. People are very, very careful in yeah. ensuring that new versions of Erlang won't break, break old systems out of production. So you know, there's a lot of conservatism there, but at the same time, I think you know new features which are needed and required are slowly being added. I think the biggest change I see uh, in the future is you know how Erlang handles distribution. We can deal with distribution um, 
uh, right now, and you can cluster up up to 100 nodes, after which you, know, you need to resort to well, sharding or something as close to as sharding as, as, uh, as, as you can think of. And at the same time, um, you know, and, and you need to apply different concepts and mindsets to it. Part of it is being done as a release project, it's called SDR, like other ideas which are being played around with is applying software-defined networking principles to Erlang itself. I can just add one comment to that about the Erlang systems itself. Um, the, the, the standard Erlang system, which basically everyone uses, is developed by, by Ericsson. And they of, course want to, they, they, of course, want something which is good enough for them to use in their internal products, which it is being used in their internal products. So the quality of the Erlang system itself is, is very good. It is product quality systems to, to do these type of things for it. So um, that gets back to development is slow, but at the same time, when it comes out, it's very well tested and works. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Francesco, for that. I think we have time for a single question, although there's uh, many more coming as we speak. The one question I'll uh, probably sort of wrap up with uh, is what are the recommended tools and, uh, you know, what would you recommend for development and debugging of Erlang applications? Um, so again, the question is uh, what yeah. tools would you recommend for development and debugging of Erlang applications and what is sort of in daily use in practice in Erlang solutions? I mean, from from the, from the development point of view, I think here Erlang Solutions, it's Vim or Emacs, but you know, you've got Erlang plugins for Eclipse and IntelliJ, yeah, and and most editors, most editors out there. And you know, the the, the approach we recommend is you know test driven development, and um, test driven development, and uh, you know continuous integration. So you, know, you need to basically set up your whole infrastructure and do it properly when you start developing. It's not just about sitting down and starting to code. Yes, and, the, and as from one of our courses, there are a number of testing environments included in the Erlang release, which are used for testing, well, other things, and also testing Erlang applications as well. There are a number of support tools that come, come with Erlang to help you, help you develop it as well, too. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Francesco, again. And once again, I'm sure everyone will join me in thanking you for taking part in this webinar and uh, giving us an inspiring talk on Erlang. Now, many thanks to all of you who have joined us for the webinar uh, on the side of the audience. Please join us again in December for our next webinar. Now, following today, we will be sending you a short survey to make sure we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Please also note that the recording of the webinar and the presentation that was shared today will also be available for you to collect on Erlang Solutions corporate website at www.erlang-solutions.com. Thank you once again, and we we'll look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar.